Oh, hey there, folks. Elder Law Care attorney Patrick Kelleher coming to you from elderlawcare.com. Folks, today's question is, what is an attorney's ethical obligation in elder law? Let's talk about that for a moment. So let's talk about the rules of play or the rules of engagement for an attorney when it comes to representation of a client. And in the field of elder law, it gets a, a little more specific and the attorney might have a higher level of care because oftentimes you're working with folks who may have what they refer to as diminished capacity. There's different levels of diminished capacity. Some, for example, someone may be diagnosed with dementia or even Alzheimer's and their diagnosis uh, could be mild, moderate or severe, mild, moderate or severe. And if that person wants to pick up a pen and sign a will or a power of attorney or even a trust, the rules say this, the rules say that person with diminished capacity still needs to possess what they refer to as testamentary capacity, testamentary capacity. Three prongs are three keys of testamentary capacity. They have to understand the nature of their assets and what they own. Number two, they have to understand who the objects of their bounty are. And also folks, they have to have a donative intent to transfer those assets, a donative intent to transfer those assets. So that is an overview of testamentary capacity. But folks, let's talk more specifically about the attorney's obligations to the client and maybe to some other ancillary folks involved in the process as well. Let's look first at Ethical Rule 1.6. What is Ethical Rule 1.6? Ethical Rule 1.6, folks, is the attorney-client confidentiality. So what the attorney and the client discuss and talk about is confidential. The attorney is not allowed to share that information with other folks unless the client gives them written authorization, okay? So that's rule 1.6. And even if someone meets with an attorney and doesn't formally hire the attorney, rule 1.6 still attaches, and the attorney still has that attorney-client confidentiality rule where they cannot disclose or share that confidential information with others. And folks, that is the general rule 1.6 which applies to any attorney-client relationship. And folks, let's talk about in the field of elder law, we have another rule called Rule 1.14. And what is Rule 1.14, folks? That is the rule working with someone who has diminished capacity. And the attorney supposed to treat that client with diminished capacity like an ordinary person, like a regular person. Uh, meet them in their place. Okay. Don't treat them um, so much differently. Uh, meet them in a place where they're at the highest level of capacity that they can possibly be at and meet them at a time of day that they're functioning cognitively uh, to the highest level of their capability. Uh, make sure the lighting's proper. Make sure the room noise is uh, soft and quiet and proper. And make sure other folks who they may be comfortable with are also present so long as you're not violating rule 1.6. So these rules can kind of interplay with one another. So you really have to have your thinking cap on in a situation like that. Also rule 1.14 talks about vulnerable clients as well, vulnerable clients. They might not reach the level of incapacity or diminished capacity, but it might be someone who is vulnerable. They might be of advanced age, living alone, maybe experiencing depression or isolation, and they've been the victim of financial exploitation or maybe family neglect. And now they share that information with you. And you're supposed to use the least restrictive means or the least restrictive alternative when helping them. So you have to be really, really careful, uh, case by case scenario, case by case basis, and you always wanna be able to help your client and with the, with the thought of how can I protect them? Do I need to report this situation of say financial exploitation if either a family member or some scam artist took advantage of them and they sent them money? Sometimes you hear about those scams. 
and they're pretty common and prevalent, so seniors have to protect themselves from those situations. In those situations, yes, would it be important to share that with other trusted family members of that elderly client with either diminished capacity or vulnerable elder client? Yes, but you may not be able to run off and share that information because you could be violating Rule 1.6, Attorney-Client Confidentiality. So you have to be really, really assess and evaluate each and one of those cases on a case-by-case -case basis. Can you report the matter to Adult Protective Services? Can you report the matter to law enforcement if it was a serious violation of elderly fraud or ex financial exploitation? And the answer is a yes, but it's a case-by-case -case basis and some states have different rules as well. From my understanding, California says no, uh, you can't violate that. So rule 1.6 that is. So you have to be very, very um, cognizant and be aware of the rules in your jurisdiction. Another interesting part of rule 1.14 folks with diminished capacity, even it states this, and this comes from case law as well. There's a case named Thicket v. Pima County. Thicket v. Pima County. So in this case right here, folks, is you may have an elderly fo a person who has diminished capacity and then not even your client. And the client is actually maybe their child who hired you to do work for them. And say the child is the attorney in fact, the power of attorney, attorney in fact, and for their elderly parent. And now that child is coming to you saying, hey, attorney, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And if you think that attorney in fact, your client, is maybe not acting in the best interest of that vulnerable elderly person or that person, aged person with diminished capacity, then Thicket v. Pima County says you also have a duty to protect that elderly person. And so, yes, you have that rule 1.6 attorney-client relationship with your client, but the rule says you have a dual duty, a dual duty to also keep an eye out and make sure the attorney, in fact, the agent for the elderly person is doing the right thing, is acting in the best interest of the elderly person who may be vulnerable or experiencing diminished capacity. So there you have it, folks. And I'm gonna talk about one more rule. It's rule 1.16. That's the attorney-client withdrawal. We call it in the industry, noisy withdrawal. What is the noisy withdrawal, folks? That is if you uh, have a bad fiduciary. You have a client who maybe is coming to you. They're the guardian or the conservator for an elderly person. They might be the attorney in fact, of, uh, they, they're the attorney in fact appointed in the power of attorney for the elderly person. And that person comes to you and they disclose and reveal information to you that you feel is completely inappropriate. It could be neglect, financial exploitation. It could be they could be misappropriate, misappropriating client funds. They could be misappropriating the elderly person's money, um, self-dealing, using the elderly person's money for their own financial gain. And now they're reporting that to you. And they're saying, hey, how can you help me deal with this? Well, it's the attorney's job to make sure that you look at rule 1.16, you have the attorney-client confidentiality with your client. Also, the attorney's job to look at and consider rule 1.14, how can we make sure we protect this person with diminished capacity or vulnerable person, make sure that the agent, attorney in fact, is doing the right thing, and you wanna guide them. And my recommendation, folks, typically is give them guidance, give them steps of action, action steps, and give them a deadline. For example, hey, bad fiduciary, you need to clean up your act, you need to clean up the books, you need to repay the money, you need to get money back from people that you may have gifted money to inappropriately and replenish the funds to the elderly person and do the right thing. And give them a deadline. Give them 30 days to take action and to correct the wrong, right the wrong, so to speak. And folks, if they fail to do that after 30 days, then you have what they call a conundrum. Um, you're in the pickle, so to speak, and you may have to take action. And you might have to use rule 1.16, which is you may have to withdraw from the case. And if the case is involved formally in the courts as a conservator, or if they're a legally appointed guardian with the courts, you may have to bring it to the court's attention. But in doing so, you wanna exercise the least 
restrictive action and bring it to the court's attention without disclosing or spilling the beans on everything. If you just notify the court and say, sorry, Your Honor, I need to withdraw from this case. I cannot represent this person any longer. And you can take a step back. And the court will probably see the implied withdrawal or see the withdrawal as an implied situation where the fiduciary may not be acting in the best interest of the protected person, the elderly person. So there you have it, folks. They're the rules of engagement when it comes to ethical obligations, and there may be others as well. And there are others, but they're the big ones that come to mind. Rule 1.6, attorney-client confidentiality. Rule 1.14, diminished capacity or vulnerable client. Thicket v. Pima County, that dual duty attaches to the vulnerable or incapacitated person, even if that is not your client. And then lastly, rule 1.16, the bad fiduciary. The bad fiduciary who's not righting the wrong, even after being advised and counseled and given that deadline and given specific action steps, if they're still failing to act in the proper manner and they're still being that bad fiduciary, then you may want to act and withdraw from the case, make that noisy withdrawal. And if you can, using the least restrictive alternative and means reporting the least amount of information as necessary to properly withdraw from that case. Thank you for tuning in and hopefully that video was helpful on the ethical obligations of an attorney and this is more specifically to ethical obligations of an elder law attorney. Folks, if you have a situation that's currently brewing or if you have a family situation where you believe in a vulnerable or elderly family member is being taken advantage of, and the fiduciary is not doing a good job, well, scroll down, folks, leave a comment. A member of our Elder Law Care team will do our very best to respond to you as soon as possible. Folks, if you thought the video was helpful, please share it with other folks that you think could benefit from this information as well. And if you'd like to learn more, folks, always go to our elderlawcare.com website, and you can pick up a copy of my book either on the website or on Amazon, Four-Headed Monster of Estate Planning and Elder Law, Patrick Kelleher. And we have educational programs there as well. Subscribe to our channel because you will learn more and please share the information as well with other folks that you think could benefit from this information. See you next time at elderlawcare.com.